Well, in the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to this uh, Christmas Eve service at Blessings. What a joy and what a wonderful thing it is to gather together on this Christmas Eve to celebrate and to remember, to, to worship together, uh, to mark together uh, that important um, time we see in Scripture, that change in history, the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's so glad you could be here. I'm Pastor Greg. Uh, Pastor Bill is here. You may have questions about blessings or what Christmas is, what Christianity, what Christian faith is all about. I hope that you will speak to one of us or one of the ushers after the service. Just so glad we could uh, mark this time uh, t- together. Also, welcome to those who may be here for the first or second time. If this is your first or second time at Blessings, we want to give you a special welcome. And there's a card in the back of many of the chairs, a welcome card. You can fill that out, hand it into one of the pastors or ushers, and we'll get back to you with any inquiries you may have. I um, also want to welcome those who are uh, joining online. So glad that you could uh, join this way as, as well tonight and, and hope to meet you uh, in person soon if we haven't already. You can also uh, email in any questions you have about blessings or Christian faith, the meaning of Christmas. We'll get back to you. Info at blessingshamilton.ca. Uh, uh, there is, of course, a, a worship tomorrow morning as well, Sunday morning. The service will be very similar to uh, tonight's service, uh, and also tomorrow night there will be uh, worship as well at 6.30. Uh, the service is a special service tonight and tomorrow morning. Uh, we'll hear all kinds of readings about the Christmas story and a message from Pastor Bill, and the service will uh, just proceed unannounced as people come forward and share and uh, read in different parts and as we sing uh, some of the wonderful songs uh, for uh, remembering Christmas time. And I invite you as you're able now to stand for our call to worship. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Crocus. The Lord will give you a sign. Emmanuel, God is with us.
you have to put Sir some cord up there. Thank you. Let us lift up our hearts. I'm going to be up here to uh, speak about and read about the Christmas story. While the shepherds were watching their flocks outside, <coughs> excuse me, outside of Bethlehem, they suddenly encountered an angel and were gripped by fear. According to one Bible translation, they were terribly afraid. In response to their fear, the angel conveys a remarkable message. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. The angel does not present the shepherds with something to do to get to God. He does not recommend a pilgrimage, discipline, ritual, or lifestyle. The angel indicates that something has been done. God has come to us. The message of Christmas, after all, is not good advice, but good news. We don't need to climb to God. In fact, we can't climb to God. But God has come to us, and he's come to save us. Christmas is the beginning of that good news. The little boy in the manger who was born for you becomes the suffering man on the cross who dies for us and the resurrected man who lives for you and me. Now, throughout this service, we will attend to different parties in the family of Christ. Before we conclude, we will see how we can be part of that family as well. The Bible reading is from Luke chapter 2, the verses 1 to 20. <clears throat> In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God 
for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Father of Jesus, David. In the story of Scripture, we learn that Christ is the Son promised to numerous fathers. He is the Son promised to Abraham, who would bless the nations with grace and truth. He is also the Son promised to David, who would rule the nations with justice and equity. When Isaiah foretells the birth of the Messiah, he prophesies that Christ will reign on the throne of his father David and that the government would be placed on his shoulders. According to the accounts of Christ's life in the New Testament Gospels, however, the only thing ever placed on his shoulders is the cross he carried to the site of crucifixion. Here we discover something remarkably distinctive and alluring about Christ's kingdom. The power of Christ is wielded in humility, love, and sacrifice, and never in arrogance, animosity, and dominance. Like his father David, Christ is a king, but his kingdom is one of perfect justice and cosmic peace. And the reading is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood 
will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Father of Jesus, Joseph. Whereas Christ's forefather David was the greatest of the Israelite kings and a folk hero for the Jews, Christ's immediate father, Joseph, was an unsung peasant carpenter in the obscure town of Nazareth. In Matthew's account of Christ's birth, Joseph must step aside 
because the child born to Mary would be conceived by the Holy Spirit. Joseph would not be the biological father. But Joseph must also step forward and name the child Jesus, conferring on Christ his own lineage and ancestry. Joseph would be the legal father of Christ, and through him Christ is the heir apparent to King David's throne. The angel who appears to Joseph also indicates that Jesus would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Jesus, God comes to us and is with us, with the worst of us and with the least of us, but with us and for us. Like his father Joseph, Christ begins his life in humility and obscurity, but is ultimately exalted. He now reigns from the Father's right hand, occupying symbolically the throne of his great forefather, David. The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus.
Luke 1, sorry, Luke 1, verse 26, the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Our dear Lord and Father, we praise you tonight that we can be together in this space at this time, Christmas Eve, to hear the story of Christmas, the account of Jesus' birth, the arrival of your Son, who came for us and for our salvation. We thank you for those who are present here tonight, for those who are viewing online. And now we pray for your presence and for your spirit to be operative among us so that the message that we hear doesn't simply enter our ears but penetrates our hearts so that we understand anew and afresh who Jesus is and what he has come to do for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the scene that is depicted in the passage that Dorothy just read is charming. An angel visits a young teenage girl and conveys a wonderful message. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for you. In terms of biblical literature, the scene is quite extraordinary because it's quite infrequent that we find in the Bible scenes that feature women only without the presence of men. The majority of the scenes that we do find in the Bible featuring women without the presence of men often are about mothers who are promised children, mothers who receive children. So the scene that is depicted in Luke's Gospel in this text that Dorothy read is domestic and it's familial, and the interaction that occurs between the angel and Mary is personal and private. And it's for this reason that the nativity scenes that you see around us, the story of Christ's birth is not opposed by people in a largely secularized country like Canada. The birth of Jesus can be commemorated the birth of Jesus can be 
celebrate it because nobody objects to a domestic Jesus. Nobody objects to a Jesus that is for the personal and private realm. But if we are attentive tonight to the angel's message to Mary, we discover that the motherhood of Mary, though it's very personal and private, has global and even cosmic significance. And Mary is enlisted, we discover, to play a role in the liberation of humanity, in the salvation of sinners, and even the renewal of the whole cosmos. She accepts this role, but she sees herself as part of the supporting cast. Her unborn child is the main actor. He is the heir apparent to David's throne, and he will be a king like no other. He will fix what is broken, he will straighten what is crooked, and he will right all the wrongs in the world. And my invitation to you tonight is for you and for me to celebrate the birth of Christ in the way that Mary does, which is to say to accept Jesus into our lives and to labor, as the Apostle Paul says, and as Mary does, to labor until Christ is born in us. And as we walk through this passage tonight, we're going to see four things. First of all, the father of Jesus, and then the mother of Jesus, and then the person of Jesus, and lastly, the disciple of Jesus. Now, this story is about the motherhood of Jesus, but before we read about his mother, we read about his father. And I want you to note with me the subject of verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel. The one in charge here is the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, please understand that at this point in Israel's history, God had been largely silent, seemingly absent for 400 years. And now, like a bolt out of the blue, he starts sending angels. Angels are quite infrequent in the Bible. But in the context of Christ's birth, there's a flurry of angelic activity, which is an indicator to us that something significant is about to occur. And God is going to send Mary, in particular, a very impressive messenger. Of all the angels that exist, we only know the names of two, Michael and Gabriel. And it's one of these named angels that God sends to Mary. Gabriel is the angel that God often enlists to convey very special messages, uh, to convey very special uh, messages, and this is the one that he sends to Mary. Now, where is Gabriel sent? He is sent, the text tells us, to Nazareth in Galilee. And I'm sure that when uh, Gabriel received that commission, he probably scratched his head and wondered why. Because Galilee was part of the land that was given to Naphtali and Zebulun after Israel conquered Canaan. It was land that in the 8th century was invaded by the Assyrians. The Jews were exiled and the land was repopulated with Gentiles. It was a land that was populated by foreigners. And in this territory called Galilee, there is this town, Nazareth. Very, very obscure. Uh, there is only one document outside of the Bible that mentions the town of Nazareth. The town of Nazareth is never mentioned in the Old Testament. It was a town that was demeaned by the Jews of Jesus' day. It was regarded as a God-forsaken place. And Gabriel must have wondered why he was being sent of all places to Nazareth in Galilee, and we should wonder as well, what is going on here? So that's the father of Jesus. He sends Gabriel to Nazareth, and to whom? Well, the mother of Jesus. He is sent to the mother of Jesus, and the first thing we learn about her is that she is a vulnerable human being. 
She is a young girl, a teenager, probably 12 or 13, without any power. You could argue that teens today have a measure of power. They have what we might call buying power. There are all kinds of goods that are marketed to teen girls today. Here was a peasant teenager that had no power of any kind. She had no significance in the world, no importance. She had no standing in the world. She was pledged to be married, we're told, to Joseph, who was a village carpenter in Nazareth and also a peasant. We know from historical records that what happened in those days is that marriages were arranged. There was a contract that was signed between a man and a a woman, both very young, both teenagers, and for a while they would live apart, and eventually the girl would leave her father's house to move into her husband's house, and the marriage would be consummated, and none of that had happened yet. So Mary at this stage was very young, 12 years old, 13 years old, perhaps 14 years old. When Gabriel is dispatched, he must have been confused. Must have been confused by the place. He was an angel of importance who was sent to announce important events, and he was sent of all places to Nazareth in Galilee. And to whom was he sent? Well, to this young, peasant, teenage girl, unassuming a girl of no importance, a girl of no significance without standing in the world. What is going on here? Well, the angels of God do God's bidding, and so Gabriel is faithful here. He goes to Nazareth, he encounters Mary, and he says, Greetings, you who are highly favored by God. Mary saw herself as a nobody, but God sees her as a somebody. She is a picture of human vulnerability, and yet she's the object of divine favor, highly favored. God has called you for a very specific and special role. And how does she respond? Well, she's startled. She responds in much the same way that Zechariah responds to the angel's visit in the story prior. She is startled. And the angel says to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. God has chosen her to be an agent in his great act of salvation. Verse 31, Gabriel explains, you will conceive and give birth to a son. So the father is busy sending an angel to the mother of Jesus, who then discloses to Mary information about the person of Jesus. And here we'll see three things about Jesus, his theological name, his political vocation, and his spiritual conception. He's given a theological name. His name would be Jesus. And if you were in church Sunday evening, Pastor Greg explained that Jesus is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Joshua, which means the Lord saves. And this is exactly what the Jews in Jesus' day desperately wanted. They wanted salvation. They wanted deliverance from their enemies, from the Romans, from oppression, from poverty. But in her worship, Israel yearned for salvation of a a very specific kind because Israel recited in her worship the, the great question of Psalm 130, if you, O Lord kept a record of our sins. O Lord, who could stand? And they recited the great conclusion of Psalm 130, the Lord will save Israel from all her sins. And that's all summed up in the name Jesus. The Lord saves. Because what the Bible teaches is that sin creates a chasm between God and humanity, and Jesus bridges that chasm. He is identified in the Bible as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He gives his life as a ransom for many. And by believing in Jesus, you can be forgiven of your sins, reconciled to God, and spiritually renewed. So Gabriel reveals his theological name, but also discloses his political vocation. Verse 32, the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, 
and his kingdom will never end. Centuries prior, God had promised King David, Israel's greatest king, that he would have a son who would also be God's son, who would sit on his throne forever and would rule over not just Israel, but the whole world. And in the Gospels, especially in Matthew and Luke, Jesus is introduced as great David's greater son, the one in whom this promise would be fulfilled. He would be the son to sit on the throne of his father, David, forever. And so the birth of Jesus, please understand, is celebrated not simply as the birth of the Savior. It's celebrated as the birth of a king and the true king of the world. This is why this event isn't just personal and private. This is why this event has global and even cosmic significance. Jesus is born as the king. That's why the message of this text is so explosive. This is why there were so many attempts on the life of Jesus, even when he was a young boy. Because it's one thing to accept Jesus as a teacher or a prophet or a guru of some sort, but the Bible consistently emphasizes that Jesus is also a king. And a king makes demands of people. The king wants allegiance and loyalty. He expects something from us. And this is why when you read through the gospel accounts and the stories of Jesus, you discover that wherever Jesus goes, he provokes people. Some people are terrified by Jesus. Others are furious with Jesus early on. There's a plot to throw Jesus off a cliff towards the end of his ministry. Of course, he is crucified and put to death. And yet for others, Jesus is alluring. And they fall down on their faces. They bend their knees and they worship Jesus. But no one meets Jesus and remains indifferent. So having received or having revealed Jesus' theological name and his political vocation, Gabriel also discloses his spiritual conception. Mary is puzzled. She asks, verse 34, how will this be since I am a virgin? How can this be? And Gabriel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Now, throughout the Old Testament, you find people that are possessed by the Spirit to perform particular tasks. We know that John the Baptist, who is presented as the forerunner of Jesus, is filled with the Spirit, but Jesus, you see, is uniquely conceived by the Holy Spirit. The power of the Most High, Gabriel says, will overshadow you, and the language there recalls the glory cloud in the Old Testament, this majestic cloud representing the presence and power of God that led the people of Israel out of Egyptian slavery through the wilderness, this cloud that rested over the tabernacle, one day filled the temple of God. And the point that is being made is unmistakable, that Jesus would not be conceived through the ordinary means of human intimacy. He would be conceived by the Holy Spirit. Well, that's so extraordinary, you say, as to be impossible, to be unthinkable, and that's exactly the point. We are to reach the conclusion that this is not ordinarily possible because the text says what is impossible with humanity is possible with God. Now, why such an unthinkable scheme? that a woman, a virgin, would be conceived by the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer that the Bible provides is that the problem with humanity is unthinkably great. And we're told in the Bible that because of the sin of Adam at the outset of human history, the whole human race is implicated, and the whole human race is corrupted so that The stream of humanity is poisoned at its very source. 
The gospel accounts of Christ's birth convey the poverty of humanity. Here we find a young teenage girl of no significance, no importance, no standing in the world, living in a God-forsaken town, obscure, occupied, and governed by foreigners. And there's nothing promising about this scene. And that's exactly the point. This is the human predicament. In the words of Donald MacLeod, the race needs a redeemer, but is incapable of producing one. We cannot produce a redeemer by decision or by desire. We cannot produce a redeemer by might or by power. We cannot produce a redeemer by education or civilization. But at Christmas, God does something remarkable, something unthinkable. He takes the initiative in the place of obscurity and poverty and conceives within the womb of Mary a human being. And in so doing, he constructs a dam to block the poisoned stream of human sin. In this way, the birth of Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit marks the arrival of God as a human. God comes to do what needs to be done, to do what we cannot do ourselves. This is what distinguishes Christianity from all world religions, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam, any religion of any kind. Every other religion says, here is what you must do to get to God. And the message of the Christian gospel is God has come to us to do what we could not do ourselves. Well, how does Mary respond to God's message? Well, here we need to see Mary not simply as the mother of Jesus, but as the disciple of Jesus. Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Mary is not the first believer in the Bible, but she is the first Christian. She is the first to hear the message about Christ and assent to it. Mary accepts Jesus into her life and into her home, and doesn't just accept Jesus into her life, she accepts Jesus at the center of her life. She is the first Christian. She is also the model disciple. She must have been nervous. She must have had some idea how difficult her life would be, She knew this child would radically interrupt her life. She knew that once she was pregnant, she would be liable to charges of adultery, whose penalty then was stoning by death. She knew that her pregnancy would occasion all kinds of questions from Joseph, from her family, from the people of Nazareth. She knew this would cost her. She counts the cost and says yes to the Lord. She agrees to be the site for God to do the unthinkable. She agrees to play a role in God's great act of salvation. She accepts the labor pains, and she's willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. She is the first Christian, and she is the model disciple And my invitation to you tonight is to celebrate Christmas the way that Mary does. To accept Jesus into our lives, but also surrender ourselves to Jesus. And to labor as Mary does until Christ is born in us. As Paul writes to the Galatians, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is is formed in you. Now, having counted the cost, Mary joins this great 
company of believers who are dubbed the Lord's servants. She joins the company of Abraham and Moses and Joshua and David and Daniel, the Lord's servant. But you say, doesn't she lose some of her freedom now to chart her own course by yielding to the Lord here? Well, this is the paradox of the Christian message that in service to God, we experience true freedom. And that by putting to death our great ambitions, we experience eternal life. C.S. Lewis concludes mere Christianity with this point, give up yourself and you will find your real self. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look to Christ and you will find him and with him everything else will be thrown in. Here's what the great New Testament scholar Richard Bauckham says about this passage. I quote, The service of God is the true liberation and fulfillment of the self. Mary is most fully herself, the active and responsible subject of her own story, when she acts as the Lord's servant, taking God at his word and taking responsibility for acting with trust in that word. So the birth of Jesus is the birth of the Savior King. And when we hear the story, therefore, we are invited to embrace Christ as Savior and to yield to him as King. And when we embrace him as Savior, we receive the forgiveness of sins and we're reconciled to the God from whom we are estranged by sin. And when we yield to Christ as King, we are liberated from our phony selves to be our true selves. Now, last night at our dinner for international students, and some of the guests who were there last night are here again tonight, and that's wonderful to see you. But I was asked the question, what is ultimately the hope for humanity And I said two things. I said, first of all, the great human problems are resolved only with theological solutions, which is to say that we cannot save ourselves. The problems we face, not least death itself, are too great for humanity. God must save us. And this is part of the message of Christmas, that in the person of Jesus, God comes to us to save us. And the second thing I said was that we need to be new people, people of a different kind. And to be new people, we need more than new habits and a new lifestyle and new friends and new ambitions. We must have new hearts which is to say that we must have Christ born in us, Christ formed in us by the power of the Spirit. So this year, let's celebrate Christmas the way that Mary does, by becoming disciples of Jesus, accepting Jesus into our lives, and yielding to him and laboring until Christ is formed in us. Let's pray together. Our dear Lord, we thank you for your mother. We thank you for Mary, blessed among women, for this remarkable girl in times past who was willing, in spite of fear, we imagine, to be the site for the conception and birth of your Son, the Savior King. We thank you for her story narrated in Scripture and for the message it conveys to us tonight. And we pray that we might follow in the footsteps of Mary to receive Jesus, to accept him at the center of our lives 
and to labor until he is formed in us. Bless us this Christmas with the hope of Christ as Savior and King. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you now have the opportunity to worship the Lord with your gifts. We are not collecting any money in the pews, but you can e-transfer funds tonight to two special causes of Blessings Christian Church. Mercy Christian Church, which is the church we recently planted on the East End, and to Streetlight Christian Church, which is a site of blessings on the North End of Hamilton. And so these funds that are collected will be distributed as gifts to Mercy and Streetlight. And of course, if you're guests with us tonight, we ask nothing of you. We're happy that you're here to join us for this service and don't feel obligated in any way to support this cause. As we think about God's goodness to us, his gifts to us in the person of Christ, uh, Samantha will sing, Come for Us.
the brothers and sisters of Jesus. The Gospel writer John reminds us that in the family of Christ, there are not only fathers and mothers, but also brothers and sisters. Unlike Matthew and Luke, John presents the Christmas story in very theological terms. He introduces Christ as the eternal Word of God, who became human and made his dwelling among us. He indicates that in the person of Jesus, you could see the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Sadly, many of his own people did not receive him. But John indicates that to those who received him and believed in his name, Jesus gave a special privilege, the right to join his family and become children of God. He gave that right to Thomas, who doubted him, to Peter, who denied him, to tax collectors, prostitutes, Samaritans, Jews, and Gentiles. He gives this right to you and me today. When we believe in his name, we join God's family as brothers and sisters of Jesus. Let's read together from John 1, the first 17 verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ.
seated for a moment while we pray. Let us come to God uh, with joy. Let us pray. Gracious Father, thank you so very much for this privilege to celebrate, to remember, to, to worship on this Christmas Eve. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior. And as Pastor Bill was, was preaching for, we pray tonight that he might be born in our own lives May be born in our, in our world anew and afresh. Lord, we wish to make, make room for Christ. Our, our lives get so crowded and distracted and misdirected. And we long for Christ to be born anew in us. And we ask for your, your forgiveness, for your renewal in our own lives and living in the name of Jesus tonight. And so we thank you for him as our Savior Lord, as we hear the, the good news uh, in the Bible about the birth of Jesus, we, we do pray for good news for our world and for our city this Christmas Eve. We thank you for Hamilton and Burlington and this whole region, and we pray for those who may be in need in any way, for those struggling with sickness, for loneliness, for those who may be depressed. We ask, O oh God, your great blessing upon all struggling in this city one way or another. Lord, we also pray for those uh, in this church and also in this uh, region for, who are celebrating maybe Christmas for the first time in this city or in this country. For those who have left homes or homelands in the last year, and we ask your strength and blessing with them. And Father, we pray for those who are going through Christmas this year, maybe remembering the, the loss of loved ones, and we ask that they may know your comfort. And Lord, we ask that you may send us uh, from here, having heard the Christmas story, that we may respond as Mary did, that we may be found as disciples of Jesus who has come to us. And so we thank you in his name on this special night. Amen. I invite you as you're able to stand for our benediction. And now may Jesus Christ, the son of righteousness who rises with healing in his wings, fill you with joy and the peace that passes understanding, and the blessing of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, be with you. Amen.